What's game in gamers? Today, I've got an Arc Hunter build for you using the Assassin's Cowl Exotic Helmet. This build is a melee oriented build and is extremely fun to play with. It's even viable in Master and Grandmaster content, although it can be finicky to use in some strikes. In case you're not sure what it does, I'll explain what Assassin's Cowl does before I get into the rest of the build. Assassin's Cowl is an exotic helmet with the perk Vanishing Execution. Vanishing Execution grants your powered melee final blows the ability to both heal you and turn you invisible, making it a very survivable build for all levels of content. Performing a finisher or getting powered melee final blows on more powerful enemies will both grant you invisibility for longer and grant you more health. This makes it such that killing higher threat enemies isn't a detriment to you, in turn making this exotic not just an ad clearing exotic but a champ busting one as well. With you now knowing what Assassin's Cowl itself does, I'll move on to the subclass build to go along with it. I'll go over a prescriptive setup first, and then describe each choice in detail, as well as alternative options should there be any. For your super, run Gathering Storm. Run the Gambler's Dodge, whichever jump you prefer, the Combination Blow Melee, whichever grenade you prefer, the Flow State Aspect, the Lethal Current Aspect, Spark of Feedback, Spark of Frequency, Spark of Haste, and Spark of Resistance. To detail the subclass build itself, firstly the super. Gathering Storm, even with the Jolt nerfs, is still a very good super. It's a set and forget super, meaning you can simply throw it at a boss and be dealing damage to that boss while you clear adds, or while you also damage that boss with your weapons. Furthermore, if you simply want to clear an area of enemies, you can throw the Gathering Storm at the ground and it will clear that area of enemies very efficiently. The Arc Staff Super, while also a really good super, relies more heavily on exotics that increase its function than the Gathering Storm does, which is why I use the Gathering Storm with this build. If you want to, however, you can use Arc Staff, and it won't change the playstyle of this build nearly at all. Onto the Dodge ability, Gambler's Dodge is a must pick, as this build makes use of the melee ability extensively. Gambler's Dodge will automatically fully refund your melee ability upon use when near at least one enemy, making it crucial for any Hunter melee spam build. As for the melee ability itself, Combination Blow is the best choice for use with Assassin's Cowl. Combination Blow will, upon getting a kill with it, fully refund your class ability, heal you a small amount, and grant you a stack of Combination Blow, which increases your melee damage. Fully refunding your class ability on kill enables a loop between your melee ability and Gambler's Dodge. Getting a kill with your melee ability grants you a Gambler's Dodge, and upon use of that Gambler's Dodge when near enemies, you instantly get your melee ability back. That loop will continue so long as you have enemies near you to either kill or dodge near, which makes it fantastic for ad clearing. Additionally, Combination Blow will heal you a small amount. Unfortunately, I don't have the exact amount of health it grants you, but I do know that it's stacked with Assassin's Cowl's healing to simply heal you even more when getting a powered melee kill. Lastly, each stack of Combination Blow you receive from killing an enemy lasts for 20 seconds and increases your damage multiplicatively by 60% for each stack, up to its maximum of 3 stacks. This leads to just around a 310% increase to your melee damage at 3 stacks of Combination Blow, which is enough to kill most adds in the game in one hit on most difficulties, as well as dealing a significant amount of damage to Majors and Champions. Onto the grenade, it really doesn't matter which you run, so use whichever you enjoy using the most. I find myself using the Pulse Grenade most of the time, but it's entirely personal preference, so again, use whichever grenade you find to be the most enjoyable to use. Now for the Aspects. Firstly, Flow State. Flow State will amplify you upon killing any enemy who is jolted, and also grants you buffs while amplified. Namely, a 200% increase to your class ability's regeneration rate, plus 50 to your weapon's reload stat, and around 50% damage resistance to all incoming damage while in your dodge animation. I find Flow State to be best for its increase to weapon reload speed, as it helps with weapon types such as shotguns and fusion rifles to reload faster, which are two weapon types I find myself using frequently with this build. However, the damage resistance while in your dodge animation is also fantastic, as that makes this build even more survivable in higher difficulty content when using your dodge to refund your melee ability. Flow State granting you the amplified status after killing a jolted target also feeds into a loop with the next aspect, Lethal Current. Lethal Current will cause your next melee attack after having used your class ability to jolt the target hit by it, which, upon the defeating of that enemy, will then grant you amplified as you've then defeated a jolted target. Furthermore, damaging a jolted target with a melee attack will also cause an aftershock to damage any nearby enemies, dealing a significant amount of damage to them as well. Lastly, damaging any target affected by jolt with a melee attack will blind them, effectively removing their ability to deal damage for the duration of the blind effect. With aspects now done, I'll get into fragments, the first of which is Spark of Feedback. Spark of Feedback will increase your next melee hit's damage by 75% after having received melee damage. 
Unfortunately, Spark of Feedback's buff only lasts 5 seconds and is consumed on the first melee hit, meaning that 75% increased damage can be very unnoticeable in most gameplay scenarios. However, Spark of Feedback does give you a plus 10 stat increase to your resilience stat, which is noticeable. The second fragment to bring is Spark of Frequency. Spark of Frequency will increase the reload speed stat of any weapon up by 50 points for 5 seconds after scoring a melee hit against an enemy. This will stack with the flow state aspect, maxing out the reload speed stat of any weapon while both buffs are active. The third fragment to bring is Spark of Haste. Spark of Haste will increase your mobility, resilience, and recovery stats by 20 points each while sprinting. This will increase your movement speed, damage resistance, and health regeneration while sprinting, which is very helpful for this build. Being a melee-oriented build, you'll be running in between enemies and groups of enemies frequently, making it very helpful for simply increasing your base stats. The last and probably most important fragment is Spark of Resistance. Spark of Resistance will grant you an additional 25% damage resistance to all incoming damage when within close proximity of three or more enemies. Making Spark of Resistance more helpful is the fact that the damage resistance will linger for two seconds upon no longer being in proximity of three or more enemies. This makes it safer to be near large troops of enemies, which is especially invaluable in Master or Grandmaster level content where enemies deal significantly more damage. There are two alternative fragments I could recommend you use over either Spark of Feedback or Spark of Frequency, those being Spark of Amplitude and Spark of Shock. Firstly, Spark of Amplitude will cause an orb of power to be summoned upon getting any multi-kill while amplified. This simply increases your orb of power generating capabilities, which will help both yours and your teammates' super regeneration rates as well as any armor mods that take advantage of orbs of power. Unfortunately, Spark of Amplitude incurs a 10 second cooldown upon the generation of this orb, meaning you only get one extra orb every 10 seconds. Additionally, it doesn't provide any stat benefits, meaning if taken in favor over Spark of Feedback, you're losing plus 10 resilience to have one extra orb of power every 10 seconds. The second alternative fragment is Spark of Shock. Spark of Shock will cause your grenades to jolt enemies, which will stun overload champions as well as simply causing them to do more damage. Spark of Shock does come with a minus 10 stat penalty to your discipline stat, but as your grenade isn't used all too often, that minus 10 penalty isn't too detrimental to this build as a whole. With the subclass build now done, I'll get into the artifact setup if you're playing during Season 21, the Season of the Deep. This season's artifact is specifically tailored to both the Arc subclass and melee builds, making this build perfect for taking advantage of artifact mods this season. On screen, you're seeing the artifact setup I use for this build, and I'll highlight everything important now. In the first column, run whichever anti-champion mods you need for the content you'll be running. In the second column, run the authorized mods for both arc weapons and melee abilities. These will lower the cost of any armor mods that affect your arc weapons or melee ability to a cost of one energy, allowing you to slot more mods into your armor. In the third column, first run the Amped Up mod. Amped Up will grant you a 30% damage resistance to all incoming damage while amplified, which simply increases your survivability. Second in the third column, run the Thunderous Retort mod. Thunderous Retort will increase the damage of your Arc Super by 30% if cast while either critically wounded or amplified. Unfortunately, it only increases the damage of the Super while you are in the Super, meaning Gathering Storm doesn't get the full benefit of this mod as the damage boost goes away once you've exited the Super's cast animation. Onto the fourth column, run the Electric Armor mod. Electric Armor will simply increase the duration of your Amplified effect by 33%, from 15 seconds to 20 seconds. This increases the uptime of being amplified, making it easier to either carry in between encounters or stay active while you hunt for more enemies to kill. For the fifth and final column, first run the Shock and Awe mod. Shock and Awe will cause a bolt of lightning to strike the location of any enemy killed with arc damage, which will damage and apply jolt to any nearby enemies. Shock and Awe does have an intrinsic 5 second cooldown, but the jolt capability is very helpful in simply increasing your damage output, especially on larger groups of enemies. Lastly, run the Lightning Strikes Twice mod. Lightning Strikes Twice will grant you an additional 130% to your grenade's recharge rate upon the throwing of your grenade for 5 seconds so long as you're on the Arc subclass. Any subsequent Arc damage kill will increase the duration of this buff by 3 seconds, up to a maximum of 20 seconds. This will increase the uptime of your grenade, and if you're running Spark of Shock, your Jolt output. With the artifact mods now done, I'll get into the armor setup for this build. I'll first go over stat distribution, then a prescriptive armor setup, and finally, I'll describe each mod in detail as well as any alternative options should there be any. For stat distribution, in the top stat grouping of Mobility, Resilience, and Recovery, spec into Resilience first, with Mobility second, and Recovery third. Resilience, as always, is the most important, as each tier of Resilience increases your overall damage resistance by 3% up to a maximum of 30% at tier 10. This is especially helpful with this build, as being a melee build, you'll be subject to burst damage more often than you would with grenade or super builds. 
Mobility is the second most important, as it increases both your movement speed and your class ability's base recharge rate. The movement speed is nice, as it will help you get either closer to or further from enemies faster than you would be able to with a lower mobility stat. However, the most helpful thing about higher mobility is the increase to your class ability's recharge rate. If playing in a fire team, especially in lower difficulty content, it happens quite often that the one enemy near to you whom you try to dodge beside to get your melee ability back is killed just before you use your dodge ability. This wastes your dodge charge, which is detrimental as this build relies on the melee ability for survivability. Having higher mobility decreases the amount of time you're left without your gambler's dodge, which, in turn, decreases the amount of time you're left without your combination blow melee ability. Lastly, recovery is the least important stat in the top grouping, however, that isn't to say you should ignore it. Recovery is an incredibly helpful stat, especially in a scenario in which you can't get close to enemies to start the melee chain, or you're without your melee and dodge abilities and can't get a chain started at all. It will decrease the amount of time it takes for your health and shields to start regenerating, as well as increasing the rate at which you regenerate both your health and shields. This makes recovery a very good stat, but as this build has its own intrinsic healing capabilities, the recovery stat is only helpful if you aren't able to heal yourself using the build. For the bottom three stat grouping of Discipline, Intellect, and Strength, spec into Strength first and then both Discipline and Intellect equally. Strength is a good stat to have, however, similar to Recovery, it's only helpful if you find yourself without your melee and class ability. All Strength does is lower the base cooldown of your melee ability. Thus, a high Strength stat is only helpful if you need to regenerate your melee ability passively. As such, if you want, you can instead run a high Discipline stat to have your grenade ability up more often. As this build doesn't use the grenade ability for anything except simply extra damage, it can be nice to have that extra damage more often with a higher Discipline stat. It's entirely your choice which to run, so weigh the pros and cons of each stat for yourself and decide which one suits your playstyle more. As for Intellect, I recommend specking into Intellect up to Tier 5. Tier 5 Intellect will increase the amount of super energy gained by getting kills. At Tier 5, you gain 20% more super energy per kill than you do at Tier 3, meaning you effectively get your super back 20% faster. Anything above Tier 5 Intellect only reduces the passive cooldown of the super, which isn't necessary for this build, and as such, I don't recommend specking into anything above Tier 5 Intellect. My armor's stats have me at 70 Mobility, 90 Resilience, 50 Recovery, 54 Discipline, 50 Intellect, and 81 Strength. Onto the armor's mod setup, I'll first put everything on screen as a prescriptive setup if that's what you prefer. After I've done that, I'll go over what each mod does in detail and describe any alternative options should there be any. On your helmet, run two hands-on mods and one harmonic siphon mod. On your arms, run two heavy-handed mods and one impact induction mod. On your chest piece, simply run whichever resistance mods you need for the content you'll be running. On your legs, run one innervation mod, one recuperation mod, and one scavenger mod for whatever subclass affinity ammo you require. On your cloak, run one Bomber mod, one Powerful Attraction mod, and one Reaper mod. As for the Helmet's mods, firstly, the two hands-on mods will increase the amount of super energy gained by getting melee kills. This will simply increase the uptime of your super, allowing you to use it more often. The Harmonic Siphon mod will cause an Orb of Power to spawn upon getting a multi-kill with any Arc weapon. These Orbs of Power will grant you super energy, as well as health and grenade ability energy via mods in your legs. However, during the Season of the Deep, using the Authorized Melee Artifact mod will lower the cost of the Hands-On mod to 1 energy. This will allow you to slot 3 Hands-On mods into your helmet more freely. I recommend this, as you get more Super Energy via Hands-On than you will from the Orbs of Power summoned from multi-kills. Furthermore, you're using your melee ability more often than you're using your Arc weapons anyways, and as such, you'll see a higher benefit from the 3 Hands-On mods than you will from 2 Hands-On mods and 1 Harmonic Siphon mod. Onto the arms mods, the two heavy-handed mods will summon a potent orb of power upon getting any melee kill. As this build will be getting melee kills most of the time, orbs of power will be summoned frequently, which will grant you super energy, ability energy, and health very frequently. The impact induction mod will serve to grant you 20% grenade ability energy upon dealing melee damage on a hidden 7 second cooldown. This will do very well to keep your grenade ability up, allowing you to jolt more targets if running the Spark of Shock fragment, or simply to output more damage if not running Spark of Shock. During the Season of the Deep, with the Authorized Melee Artifact mod, you can run three heavy-handed mods if you want. This will cause the Orb of Power summoned to be very potent, granting you even more super energy upon pickup. I find this to be less useful than just running the Impact Induction mod, but it's an option if you think that's more beneficial to your playstyle. For the Chest Pieces mods, simply run whatever resistance mods you need for the content you'll be running. I generally run two of whatever element the threat modifier is, and depending on the enemy race I'm fighting, either a Concussive Dampener or a different Elemental Resistance mod. 
Stacking three of the same elemental resistance mod has no extra effect over just running two of them, so always make sure to only have two of one type equipped. Onto the legs mods, firstly the Innervation mod. Innervation will grant you 10% grenade energy upon the collection of an orb of power. As you'll be generating orbs very frequently, this will ensure you have your grenade up frequently as well. Next, the Recuperation mod will grant you 70 health upon the collection of any orb of power. Recuperation doesn't stack with itself currently, so there's no reason to run more than one, but the 70 health it gives you will stack with the healing granted by Assassin's Cowl and Combination Blow, meaning every kill will effectively heal you to full health. Lastly, the Scavenger mod will cause ammo bricks to grant you more ammo per pickup, which is beneficial for both special and heavy weapons. Because you can't pick up any orbs of power while your super is full without armor charge mods, if you want, you can forego the Scavenger mod in favor of a Surge mod. The Surge mod will serve two purposes. Firstly, it will grant any weapon that matches its element a 10% boost to damage while you have any stacks of armor charge. Secondly, it will allow you to pick up orbs of power while your super is full, which will then allow you to receive the grenade energy via innervation and the health via recuperation without having to use your super. Personally, I change between a Scavenger mod and a Surge mod frequently. I use Scavenger mods when I'm leveling up crafted weapons or running certain solo content, and I use Surge mods when I'm running higher difficulty content as I know I'll need the healing from recuperation. It's entirely your choice which to use, so use whichever suits your playstyle and needs better. Lastly, for the Cloaks mods, the Bomber mod will grant you 10% grenade ability energy upon the use of your class ability. As you'll be using the Gambler's Dodge incredibly frequently, you'll be granted this 10% energy just as frequently, serving to increase the uptime of your grenade significantly. The Powerful Attraction mod will cause any orbs of power nearby you to be automatically collected upon the use of your class ability. I find this to be very helpful, as the orb summoned by Heavy Handed has a habit of not being collected and then running away from you, taking its super energy, grenade energy, and health with it. Powerful Attraction will ensure you get the orb of power, as you'll always be using your dodge ability after having gotten a melee kill to refund your melee ability. Lastly, the Reaper mod will cause your next weapon final blow after having used your class ability to summon an orb of power. This isn't all too helpful, as you're using your melee ability to get kills most of the time anyways. But, it's a nice boost to your weapon's utility, as the first kill you get with it will almost always summon an orb of power due to the frequency with which you use your class ability. With the armor build now done, I'll get into a couple of weapon recommendations for this build. I'll first describe a few weapon traits that synergize well with this build, and then detail a few weapons that can roll the aforementioned traits. Firstly, any shotgun you have with either 1-2 Punch or Trench Barrel will work very well with this build. 1-2 Punch will grant your powered melee ability 40% extra damage for 1.2 seconds after having hit an enemy with all the pellets in a shot from your shotgun. This effect is refreshable so long as you hit all of your shotgun's pellets in a subsequent shot, meaning you can almost always have 1-2 Punch's damage boost so long as you're hitting enemies with all of the pellets from your shotgun's shot. Enhancing the 1-2 Punch perk on any crafted shotgun will cause 1-2 Punch to proc when hitting 10 of the 12 pellets shot. This allows you to miss 2 pellets of any shot and still be granted the 40% extra damage to your powered melee ability. Trench Barrel is almost opposite to 1-2 Punch in that it will buff the shotgun itself instead of the melee ability. Upon damaging an enemy with a non-projectile melee ability, any shotgun with Trench Barrel on it will be granted 50% extra damage, an increase to its reload speed stat, and an increase to its handling stat for 5 seconds, or for 3 shots, whichever happens first. Trench Barrel will make your shotgun feel that much better to use, and as you'll be in close proximity to enemies constantly, shotguns are a good option for this build. Enhancing Trench Barrel on any crafted shotgun will increase the reload speed and handling stat boosts even further. Unfortunately, I don't have the exact numbers by which these stat boosts are increased. On to perks that aren't specific to any one weapon type, firstly, Swashbuckler. Swashbuckler will grant your weapon 33.3% extra damage for 4.5 seconds upon getting any melee kill. This timer is refreshed any time an enemy is killed with a melee attack, effectively granting any Swashbuckler weapon 33.3% extra damage for the duration of any engagement you're in. Enhancing the Swashbuckler perk on any crafted weapon will cause the 4.5 second duration of the buff to be increased to 6.5 seconds. Lastly, for weapon perks that would synergize with this build, there's Grave Robber. Grave Robber will cause the magazine of your weapon to be reloaded fully and instantly upon getting a melee kill. This is very good for weapons with long reloads such as shotguns or fusion rifles, and can be very good for keeping your weapon's magazine topped up essentially passively. Unfortunately, Grave Robber doesn't proc any reload perks, such as Kill Clip or Volt Shot, as those perks require manually reloading the weapon. However, for simply making sure your weapon has a full magazine when you need it, Grave Robber is a good perk. Enhancing the Grave Robber perk doesn't change what it does or how it operates, and instead simply grants the weapon a passive plus 5 stat boost to its handling stat. 
Now, I'll go over a couple of weapons that can roll a couple combinations of the perks I've just mentioned. For shotguns that can roll Grave Robber and either Trench Barrel or 1-2 Punch, there are the Deadweight Shotgun from the Gambit Weapon Pool, the Xenoclast 4 Shotgun from the Vanguard Weapon Pool, and the Basso Ostinato Shotgun from Terminal Overload on Neomuna. For weapons I enjoy using with the Grave Robber and Swashbuckler combination, there are the Out of Bounds Submachine Gun from the Crucible Weapon Pool, the Borrowed Time Submachine Gun from the Gambit Weapon Pool, and the Royal Executioner Fusion Rifle from the Season of Defiance. As for exotics that are good with this build, the Legend of Acrius shotgun with its Catalyst is really good, as its Catalyst grants it the Trench Barrel perk. Personally, I don't have Legend of Acrius, but I've seen it do a lot of damage even when not running a melee-oriented build. Another weapon that's really fun to use is the Monte Carlo Auto Rifle. Monte Carlo's exotic trait, Markov Chain, effectively has both a better version of the Swashbuckler perk and the Grave Robber perk. Upon getting a melee kill, Monte Carlo's magazine is fully refreshed as it would be with Grave Robber, and it's granted 65% extra damage, which is just about twice as much damage as Swashbuckler grants. As Monte Carlo is also an exotic primary weapon, it already has an intrinsic 40% boost to damage without having its exotic trait active, making Monte Carlo a lucrative damage option for a primary ammo weapon. With weapons now out of the way, I'll get into a quick playstyle with which you can play to make this build both fun and safe to use. When entering an engagement, first hunt for low health adds. Enemies like Fallen Shanks or Dregs, Hive Thrall or Acolytes, etc. Melee kill these enemies to build up to 3 stacks of combination blow, and then you can start going after the higher health, higher threat enemies. Enemies like Hive Ogres or Cabal Colossuses have powerful stomp attacks, so be careful when going after them and ensure there are adds nearby them in case you need to heal yourself. But being aggressive is the best way to stay alive. Assassin's Cowl will heal you upon getting kills. Combination Blow will heal you slightly upon getting melee hits, and the Orb of Power generated by Heavy Handed will heal you upon its collection. All of these combined lead to a very safe, very fun aggressive playstyle. And if you are low on health, you're made invisible after having gotten a melee kill, so use that invisibility to get to a safe spot to heal yourself passively. But that's all for this video, thanks for watching! I apologize for my lack of uploading over the last couple weeks, I've been working on a very in-depth guide for the Ghosts of the Deep Dungeon and I got very sidetracked on that. I'll be going back to one build video a week from now on, but I'll be sticking with the Hunter Titan Warlock rotation. I'm doing this to allow myself the time to work on larger projects like the guide I'm working on for Ghosts of the Deep, so I thank you for your understanding. If you have any questions about this video, any suggestions for future content, or simply anything you'd like to say, please leave them in the comments. I read them all and appreciate any and all constructive feedback. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like, and if you want to see more content like this, subscribe. Again, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next week with a Titan build video.